Thank you all for joining today. Um, we are still moving, and today we're gonna discuss chapter five, and uh, it's gonna be led by Jedi. Um, right? Um, yeah, Jedi. Thank you for accepting to um lead this discussion today, and uh, the floor is yours. And uh, yeah, thank you. So yeah, this is my first book club, um, first presentation for book club. So I hope I do okay. <laughs> um, so I am talking about reading and writing uh, formats in Python. So before we even get to start with data analysis, the fun part, we first have to load in our data. So um, in this chapter, we work with text, binary, web APIs, and databases. So the most um, common probably for most of us will be like read CSV. Um, so most of these reading and writing um, functions come from the Pandas library. So um, they each function gets called with the pd dot read and then underscore whatever the the file type is so for example that's like pd dot read underscore csv and the book has this table 6.1 that lists all the different data types pandas can read and then there are about 50 arguments for just reading csvs and so generally he recommends to just look at the pandas documentation which is linked here for finding which arguments you might need and then um, he lists some of the most frequently used in table 6.2 so for this chapter i am mostly using the palmer penguins data set just to finally get to bring in real data rather than you know the toy examples that we've been um, using through the past few chapters. So to import, we'll start with just importing pandas, the CD, like the, name, the uh, normal convention. And then we do pang pa uh, penguins equals pd dot read csv. And then it's just the file path as a string. And then we um, can call the head um, method and print just the first five rows and we have our data frame. And feel free to stop me at any time or interrupt if you have any questions. So some of the different uh, ways to kind of import the data with some wrangling um, in one step is uh, listed in these like categories of indexing columns, inferring data types, um, parsing date and time. So we'll walk through some of them. So indexing um, basically gets the column name from the file or from this argument. So you can either not specify it and it will have the like zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Um, but then if you want to index it and say have the index be species, you would just add this argument index call equals species, or you could use a numeric um, like row or index call equals zero to pull this. I just prefer to put in column names so that I remember what they are in the future. And then you can print the first five rows and we have this um, indexed data, penguins data frame. We can also convert um data type and list additional um values to count as missing so python normally uh will use nan as um the uh placeholder for missing values so um if you have missing values and you want to and they're specified in a certain way in your data file like for example just to be silly, like we'll say that males are actually supposed to be missing because there's no such gender or sex as male. So if we specify NA underscore values equals male, then it will read in male as missing. So you'll have NAN printed. Then you can also parse dates and times um, in the same step as reading in the CSV. 
with the parse underscore date call and you pass in um, a dictionary, I believe. Please correct me if I get any of like the actual terminologies wrong. I'm still trying to get a grasp on this, but I think this is the dictionary because we have the key and then the values. So you can, um, I in the Penguins data set, it normally just comes with year and then I added month and day just so that we can have this example. So we can have um, basically parse dates is combining month, day, year into one uh, column. So it looks like this. Um, but if, so this first step, actually I didn't print it um, or it's not printing for some reason. Um, but this first one, it will actually print like just the month number space, day, space, year. Um, so then you actually need to use this other method CD to date time. And then that will actually parse the dates into the correct format. So then we have the year dash month dash uh, day. And you can see that the D type is date time now. So then you can also iterate through really large files. So um, like I've been printing just the first five rows um, to show you guys what it looks like but you can actually just read in five rows if you want to. Like you can use n rows equals five and then it'll just read in the first five. Then the other um, nifty option for um, reading in large files by chunks is using chunk size in text file reader. And this will actually like aggregate and summarize the data at what so this is kind of cool because usually like, you know, in R, I think we normally, will, if we're using the tidyverse, end up um, like importing the data and then piping it through like dplyr or summarize, a group by summarize, et cetera. But this way you can define this chunker and how many like pieces you want to like read at one time. So it iterates through each chunk. And then, um, so this is a special class, um, chunkers, like pandas.io, parsers, readers, text file reader. So then you have to use a loop um, to get each piece from the chunk and then aggregate it. So like right here, we've got the species and the count. So if you add all these up, we have got like 322 rows in the data set. And so now we know there's 152 Adelaide, 68 chin strap, and 124 Gentoo. And then we can also um, import like semi clean data before we get to the true data munging or wrangling. So if you wanted to import just a subset of the columns, you can use the, the argument use calls and then either provide an index of the, or the, um, column numbers or um, column names. Um, and so we're, we're reading in by the column number and then we're specifying that we're going to replace the header because this data set already had an existing header. So if you don't include header equals zero, I don't think it works um, because you have to specify that you want to replace the existing header. So then you, you can use names to um, change to define what names you want to use. So for each like zero was species, one was island, six was sex, and I just capitalized them. Are there any questions with this first part of just reading CFDs? Cool. Um, um, so writing the, oh yeah. Okay, um, this header, the, does the file doesn't have header before? Yeah, so you can specify if it doesn't have a header. And I think in the the um, book, there's an example of that too. Let me pull that up. Mm. Okay, I don't want to waste spend too much time um, looking for it, but either in here or the pandas documentation, um, it will, there, I think there was an example. I should have included that, my, my apologies. Um, but yeah, if it's, oh, you can specify it to none if there is no header row, that's what it is. So if you um, put header equals none, 
then it will just read in your data um, without specifying a header. Okay, so writing data to text format. So um, to write a CSV file, we can use the to underscore CSV method. And um, most of the time we'll want to declare like index equals false so that the numbers aren't stored in the first column. So like, this is just a screenshot of running it without any arguments. And so you see, we have the index of the row numbers, which usually we don't need or want. So by getting, setting index equals to false, then it will get rid of that first column. And then, um, it will print missing values as just empty strings. And so if you want to put a placeholder, you can specify like NA rep equals NA, and then you'll have um, actual like missing placeholders. Okay, so Wes said that most of the time pandas will work, but Sometimes tabular data, if there's weird things with it, like multi multi um, delimiters, and you might need to use um, the CSV module. So you'll load that in, and then you can use csv.reader, and it'll print. It'll um, give you the CSV reader object, and then you actually have to write a little for loop to print the lines. And that just gives you the heading. So then we have to use this with open, um, pass in the path of your file, and then um, list each um, row basically, because that's what the CSV reader is doing. And then on um, this, this line here, header values, it's this um, basically getting two separate uh, strings. So the first one is going to be header, and the second one is line is the value. And so it looks like this. And then you have to use um, this dictionary comprehension and expression zip uh, wildcard values, and it will um, like basically zip up the header and the values together to create one dictionary. And this was kind of a confusing part for me. So I definitely needed to look back at chapter three where um, we talked about dictionary comprehensions and that kind of thing. But basically it's just saying like for each, um, and honestly, like if somebody else knows this better, then please feel free to chime in. But um, it's taking, it's matching like each header uh, to the values and then zipping them together to give you one data frame. Um, or actually not even to give you a data frame yet. It, this is just a, a dictionary. So then the next step is to use this from dict method. And then that will actually print you your data frame. So in this chapter, Wes does this a lot of where he'll show a really simple like three line um, code to do something like this, super easy. And then he'll show something like this where there's like multiple code chunks and just like really complicated. And I am still trying to wrap my head around like when you should use each thing. So um, yes. Yeah, so yeah, this, this was a lot of steps to do exactly the same thing that pandas did very easily. So um, moving on, uh, this is kind of getting into like, if you have different delimiters, it's not comma delimited. delimited. Um, if you have different like line terminators, uh, the um, reading functions, they use a dialect like subclass and you can either define your own subclass, like if you have a lot of files that are maybe um, like semicolons instead of columns, uh, commas, then you can define your own subclass. 
And then you can reuse that. So by passing the dialect equals and then what you, whatever you call to your class. And then the other option is like, if you, if most of the um, like file type is the same as just a regular CSV, but maybe the delimiter is different, then you can just pass in like the parameters that you would pass into the dialect class. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways to do things in programming, right? So when do we use what? For most data, we can just use pandas read functions and then you can get to what you need based on using the right parameters and the right arguments. But if there's um, extra things that you need to do to format your data correctly, you can use the CSV reader with the dialect or by passing in the dialect parameters. So generally go with pandas, but then if you have even more complicated things, then um, you'll need to use the string module with the split method or resplit. So Les in the textbook just kind of briefly mentions this in a note box with no examples. So I am going to leave that for you all to figure out on your own if you ever need to. <laughs> But the uh, pandas documentation is linked up here. So like, I'll just show this really quick because it is kind of amazing. So this is the input output um, list of all the different options of either reading or writing from pandas. And then like the read CSV, like these are all the arguments just to read in the CSV. So there's really the <laughs> documentation of uh, figuring out which um, arguments you should use and what kind of um, mm. parameters will go into them. It's hell too much. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so I reference this a lot while going through these, this chapter. So highly recommend. Okay, so now let's go to other limited things, this, I think. Okay, so JavaScript uh, object notation or JSON data. Okay, so um, standard format is usually JSON um, or HTML or XML, which we'll get into in the next section of web scraping. But JSON is um, can be really nested and it's pretty free form. So it's not tabular like your general like CSVs that we just talked about. So some other differences, um, it, instead of NAN, it uses null, doesn't allow trailing commas at the end of lists and it has um, objects which are like dictionaries in Python, arrays, which are like lists in Python, and then strings, numbers, booleans, and nulls. So uh, we'll move from the Palmer Penguins data set and make up a data set of my cats, names, <laughs> types, and sex to demonstrate JSON data loading and writing. So these are my cats, my Ty and Sky. <laughs> And uh, first we need to import the JSON module. So we'll do import JSON and then use the json.load to convert a JSON string to Python. So I just copied um, like what Wes had done and created a JSON object and modified it. Um, and then um, use the json.load and then put in your object to get your Python. Um, so when you print this JSON to Pi, this is what it looks like. It's just a string. And then when you look at the type, it's actually a dictionary. So we can use the pd.dataframe to make a data frame from this dictionary. So to do that, we can put um, our uh, string name and then what the object um, that we like want to focus on is called. So um, like name JD doesn't only really matter in this case. So we'll put in pets 
because we want to start like a nesting at the pets level. And then the columns, um, we just put a name type sex. And then you get it in this nice, beautiful data frame. Then to go the other way around, you can use json.dump and it will um, put your data back into a JSON stream. So like the uh, JSON to Pi was dictionary and then we're converting it with JSON dump to a uh, string type. And then this is what it looks like again. We can also use read, uh, pandas read JSON and to JSON to um, read and write JSON files. So if you wanna write a JSON file, you just um, put in your data frame and then dot and to JSON and then where you want to write your file to with your um, file name and extension. So then we can also um, import this file that we just wrote by using the pd.readjson with the same argument of what the path and file is. And since um, I'm, I basically just forked the the repo and I'm working within the R project. Um, I only need to put the like folder, subfolder that I'm working in. And then we get, you know, the regular the data frame back. Okay, any questions on JSON files? Okay, moving on to HTML. So um, PD read HTML, it uses, XLML and beautiful suit for an HTML5 list um, to write and read um, HTML and XML files. So Pandas, it generally will try using XLML first because it's faster. And then if that doesn't work for some reason, like if the file is um, malformed, Somehow, then it will try to parse it using beautiful soup for and or HTML5 lib. Um, if you have a preference, then you can specify what flavor you would like to use with the flavor argument. So um, Wes pulls in this data table from this website. And this is actually my first time doing any web scraping. So this was very exciting for me to I've before. And uh, it's amazing because it's so simple. It's like one, uh, one call. And um, the website that we're scraping from, and we just PD, read HTML, put in the URL, and say that we want to use this. And I mean, this is optional, the HTML5 web. And then, uh, yeah, you can um, see the length of how many tables are on the page. So in this instance, there is only one table. So we only have one table here. And then um, and print the, the table. And this is just really amazing to me. So then XML is the more general format than HTML. Structurally, they're similar, um, but they um, have their own separate uh, formats and functions. So um, this is from this Microsoft um, example XML file. And this is just general, like what it looks like. And then we can use the pandas read underscore XML and put in where we save the file. So I just created a copy and paste of this and uh, added it to this data folder. And then um, so that it can be read in and printed. So we went from this to this, which is so much easier to read. So then if you want to manually do something like Wes offers the um, quick process in a textbook, um, which I'm not gonna, which I didn't uh, actually like copy the code for, but basically it's the same as the like writing um, 
Excel or the reading the Excel or the CSV file with the like six different code chunks. But basically it, it takes these four different steps of um, importing this LXML module um, and then using this objectify method to create a dictionary and then convert that list of dictionaries into a data frame. And I'll just quickly show you what that looks like in the book because it's a lot. <laughs> Okay, so this is his example, and then he's got one, two, three, four, four code chunks to do exactly what was done with just PD uh, read XML. So again, highly recommend just using pandas when it's possible. Um, so then, uh, binary data formats. Okay, so this is something I've never heard of before, but Python has this pickle module, and I had to do a lot of Googling about like what is pickle and like why would we use it. So the Python documentation is linked here, and it has lots and lots of information. Um, but basically, if you want to store something or pass it, um, like if you're working on a machine learning project and you're training your model, um, you can load that data into a byte stream that's um, easily, I guess, stored and maintained. And then you can load that back in when you're ready to start using that model again later. So this pickle module within Python, it transforms any pandas objects into a um, byte stream and pickles unique to just python so if you wanted to print if you wanted to uh, convert um, a pandas data frame to a pickle then you'd use the to pickle method and so i'm just showing here like the Unpickled penguin type is just the data frame, pandas data frame. And then when we do penguins to pickle and then load in that, then we get a um, pickle file, which looks like um, this, which you can't actually read, um, but it, it does generate a new file. And then you can do whatever processes you want with that um, style um, and data frame, or not data frame, but pickle object. And then you can put it back into your pickle. <laughs> so you can pickle and then unpickle, and then if you need to again pickle. So it's just like a conversion between text and binary. Uh, and yeah, I don't fully have my head wrapped around it. <laughs> Sam, what's your question? Yeah, um, I just have a question like, what do they mean like um, the pickle serialized and deserialized data? Um, yeah, so from what I understand is like, um, when it's non-serialized, that's like the human readable format that we're used to, like in CSVs and JSON. Uh, when you serialize it, it just goes into bytes, like 0, 1, 0, 1, like binary code. And so it's not human readable, but it's um, more portable between, um, I guess, systems. And yeah, I guess it's better for memory also. Um, there's some warnings, though, that come with pickling, um, which is that it, the format is not stable over time. So if you pickle something, and then there's an update in one of the Python modules um, or pandas, then you potentially can not unpickle it and it will be stuck in the pickle format. And so the other thing is that the pickle module is not secure. So um, people can actually like tamper with a pickle file. And so um, they recommend you not open pickles that you are unsure of their source. 
and security. So there's this, I guess, other module called HMAC, which um, Python documentation recommends using to sign your pickle files. Somehow they make sure that it's not tampered with, or at least lets you know if somebody's tampered with it. So I guess like the bottom line for pickling is like if you need to serialize data and you're just working in Python, um, then this is a good option. Um, yeah. So we can also like pickle something in Python and use it in R. R doesn't, so pickle is Python specific only, right? You cannot. Yeah, as far as I understand, like you can only open a pickle in the Python. Mm -hmm. So there is no compatibility between R and pickle stuff in Python. <laughs> Correct, yeah. So then there's like these other formats, which they mention like um, later on, they'll talk about um, H, D, what is it called? Um, we'll get there. H, D, F5, and then there's the Pi era, Parquet. There's other binary formats that are more machine readable, uh, less human readable, but better for like portability. So pickle is just one option for, um, for Python. So Excel files, Sharon, did you have another question? Um, for Excel files, um, you can use, so you have to actually install a couple other um, packages um excel rd and open pi excel um pandas will automatically try like whichever one is needed based on the file extension so excel rd uses the old xlx and then open pi excel uses is used for the newer excel sx files so if you install those um, you can use pd.readxl, and it takes basically the same arguments as the use CSV. So the same thing as what we did above, we can um, specify the path and file name that we want to read, and then the index column is species, and then we can also parse the date. And then <clears throat> you can see that it's basically the same output as above. So if you wanted to use multiple or read in multiple sheets at one time, then you can, um, so I created this separate spreadsheet that has a different sheet for each species of penguin. So reading in that spreadsheet and then printing the sheet name by using the sheet name command, um, by passing the object period sheet name, um, then we can get all the, the sheet names. So this is another um, like pandas special Excel file class. And then um, we can parse each of these sheets into a dictionary by specifying sheet name argument as none, or you can read in a subset. So if this is none, then you'll read in all of the sheets. So Chin, Strap, Gentoo, and Adelaide or Adelie. But then if you wanted to do just chin strap, you would just replace this none with chin strap. And then the other way to get a subset, like if you wanted to read in all sheets, but now you only want to look at chin strap, then you can use um, this like subsetting notation. So sheets, which was my data, or which is what I call the object. Um, and then pass in the Column. species that you're interested in, and then you can get just the chin strap. Do you have a question? No, it's OK. <laughs> OK. Um, so then writing one sheet uh, to Excel. So if we wanted to write just the chin strap group, then um, so we have this object chin strap. That's a data frame. And then we can use the two Excel. And so this is a very similar pattern to like the read underscore and then whatever file you want. Um, you can use this dot to underscore whatever file you want for most file types. So in this one, we're just writing chin strap to a Excel spreadsheet. So it gets a little bit more complex 
if you want to write to multiple sheets. So you would use this Excel writer class. So um, this is creating a separate um, object for Gentoo. So then we'll use this writer, create this writer object. So writer equals pd.xl writer. And then this is the spreadsheet that we want to write to. And then for each object or each sheet, you will have to use um, the 2xl writer and then the sheet name. So the writer is the spreadsheet that you want to write to. And then each sheet should be called um, separately. And I'm sure you can do it like if you have a lot of sheets to write, you could probably do it more efficiently, but this is just showing um, that it's possible. And then writer.save saves this file with these new uh, data inserted. Any questions on Excel? No. Okay. So then HDF5, this one was also a little tricky for me to understand, but this is a, a data format that's hierarchical and it's kind of cool because it uses or it can store multiple data sets with their associated metadata into one file. And it's pretty efficient for um, mostly reading. Uh, there's a note later in the chapter where Wes mentions that um, th this file format is best for, um, I think he said like write once, read many. So um, it's, it's better if you're working locally and um, are basically just creating this data set and then are going to be like reading it and not necessarily modifying it. So to use the HDF, you have to install PyTable. It has a different name um, in PyPy. Um, so if you're using PIP, you'll have to use install tables rather than PyTable. But basically the HDF5 is like a dictionary class um, when you're using pandas. So um, there's this um, method HDF store, and then that will actually store your data into a H5 file. And then you can access the data within that file based on um, uh, like dictionary syntax. So um, what is the object or what's the file and then what's the part you want to get. So right here we're naming, we're storing the pet data frame into the store as pet. And so then if we're printing pet from store, we get our pet data frame. So then you can, uh, there's a couple of options for HDF store. You can store it either as a fixed schema or a table schema. So fixed is the default and it's faster, but table allows you to query. And the syntax I think is um, not quite like SQL, but um, maybe like the same arguments. I'm not entirely sure, but Basically, if you specify um, that you want the pets data frame to an HDF file, you specify what the file, where and what the file will be, and then what data you're passing into it. And then if you put format equals table, then this um, H5 file will be saved as a table HDF file. And then when you read it, you can pass in a query. So I only want the column of names. So then when you read this, you only get the one column. So um, yeah, here's this note of using it for write once, read many. Um, if you're working on like a remote server more than you are locally, then there's other um, better binary formats like Parquet and I think Arrow and other others. So, yeah, does anybody have any experience with these HDF files? No. They seem cool. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> only the 
only the pickle. I know pickle only from machine learning, but the yeah. <laughs> but the HDFI. So it's also binary, the same way pickle function binary is also the head d5 right yeah i believe so which is like a little bit confusing because i guess i don't really fully understand like the difference between text and binary because i thought binary should just be like zero and ones and not human readable but he thought this um hd 5f format in binary so i think actually um as i'm saying this out loud and like i think maybe getting a better handle on it um when i try to open the dot h5 file it's really weird so i think it is binary um let me see here so how it looks very strange and is not readable so this is an h5 file <laughs> it's yeah just kind of a bunch of gibberish I don't know if like this is what it's supposed to be, but yeah, that's what it is. Hmm. Uh, are you showing it on your screen? Sorry, if I missed yeah, it. Yeah, can you see it? No, no, I cannot see. Oh, maybe I'm only sharing what the one screen. Hold on a second. We can see the book now. Yeah. Okay. How about now? Can you see the oh, whole screen? It really is yeah. gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really weird. So I guess this is how a text interpreter interprets binary files. I don't really know because I've never actually like opened a like straight zero one binary file. So okay. yeah, um, I created this separate subfile subfolder called data. So if you want to play around with any of these examples and see what they look like, then they're, they're all there when I eventually push it to GitHub. Okay, so then let's see. Okay, interacting with web APIs. So this uses the request package and um, I'll show you the actual website that I pulled from if you want. A different example, he uses a cool, um, he uses a GitHub API. So this is what I just like Googled free APIs. Um, <clears throat> so this is where we're pulling from. And so we're specifying URL. Um, we're, we're asking for the response from when we get that URL. And this prints a response status. So response is 200, which is okay. If it's like 404, it usually means like not bound. And so if uh, he recommend, Wes recommends um, calling this raise for status function, um, every time you do a, a get from a website, because it will give you more information on the, the error if there is one. So um, this, gives you a JSON um, if you want to specify, like you can, I think specify multiple formats, but this API specifically gives the JSON format. So it returns a single random new animal object in JSON format. So we'd use this um, response or rest.json and then it will print um, or it will grab all the animal data. So this would just print a string first. And then if you want it in this nice data frame output, then you would need to call it um, with the data frame uh, function. And then it's also important to wrap the dictionary in brackets to make it a list. Otherwise, you'll get this error that says if you're using all scalar values, you must pass an index. And this tripped me up for like 15 minutes because it was giving me this error. So in, I guess this is actually the case for any dictionary that you want to make a data frame, you need to put the brackets around it to make it a list. So um, yeah. And then interacting with databases, um, you can use the SQL Lite 3 um, package and then um, set up a connection. So 
you can use the dot connect and then the database will be called my data. And then you can create a table in that database using um, execute and then whatever is inside your query or um, call, I guess. And then the commit actually pushes it to the database. And then if you wanted to insert rows, then you set up your data. Um, and then this is, I guess, SQL syntax with like the insert into and then the question marks for placeholders for each of the columns. And then um, you use execute many and combine a statement with your data, to actually uh, combine it and push it into the table um, with the, um, let's see, getting kind of lost. Okay, so yeah, this is this is in this is setting up the rows that you want to add, and then this is the statement or basically the SQL function, and then the execute many um, pushes that statement onto the data, and then you can commit that or push that um, those rows into your data space, and then um, to look at the data, we set this cursor object and then use the execute method to select from the table. The table's name is state. And then we can specify the rows and use cursor.fetch all and that will print or that will get you all of the rows. So it's kind of uh, confusing to me as far as like um, remembering which parts do what. Like we have different strings that we're naming based on like what we want to do to the database. And then we also have like this connection object con. And then we also have this cursor object. And um, like they all play together in all my cat's making a mess. Uh, they're all playing together um, to actually like work in the database just through these lines of code. So then to actually get the, this data into a data frame, you have to use this cursor description where you can, um, so if you just print the cursor description, it looks something like this, where it has the column names that I specified when creating the table. And then I don't really know what the none is, but it's all there. Um, so then you use the data frame and you specify your rows, which you had to fetch from cursor. And then you use the for loop to grab um, the column name from that cursor description. And then you can have your data frame here. So <laughs> this is a lot, <laughs> I know. And this is, uh, in typical West fashion, I guess, of showing like the really complicated and hard manual way first. And then there's an easy way. So the easy way is SQL alchemy. And this is taking all of what we just did above into two lines of code. <laughs> so um, you still have to create the table. Um, so it doesn't take this first chunk away. Um, like you have to create the database, you have to create the table. But then instead of this chunk and this chunk and this chunk, all you have to do is PD read SQL, select from state. <laughs> and um, oh yeah, and then set the engine. So the SQLite is the database that we created. So um, you still have to create that um but then to actually like read the data instead of doing this whole cursor description uh fetching rows and all of that stuff you just use this one line of um specifying like your call uh directly in this argument as opposed to setting multiple string variables with your sql functions or queries so Yes. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs> um, yeah, today um, 
pandas is so great and too much to know all. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it turns out that when I try to do something with Python, especially for data analysis, I don't just, I just go back to R and do it quickly. <laughs> so <Right>? like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Jadi. Um, that's a good presentation. Um, yeah. Um, so next week we're gonna have Layla, yay. <laughs> Yeah, so let's see, Leila is going to give us uh, the next chapter, um, which I believe is um, data cleaning and preparation. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, anyone wants to add something before we go? Okay. I just want to say thank you for a very good presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is funny here. I can't hear you back. Um, you we can, can hear us? We can hear you. Sorry, I can't hear you back. No mind. Uh -oh. Okay, no. I can hear you now. Okay, yeah, so um, I think um, we are missing you. We can hear you. Thank you, Jadi, for good presentation. Um, you really did a good job for, you know, getting even out of the book, bring some nice example to show, okay, the real protocol, how to do the presentation, which is awesome way to, you know, present the chapter to see how to apply. Thank you very much for that. And I hope you can check, take another chapter ahead so that we will enjoy a good presentation. As well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you all. And um, I think we see next week, the same time. Ciao, ciao. Next week, ciao, ciao, bye-bye. Isabella, bye. if you have a second, I have a Corta question for you. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Isabella is here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm having issues. Like I can, um, I can preview Corto when I use the Corto library. Mm -hmm. um in r but when i try it in the terminal it's not recognizing um the nd format package so i'll show you um, um i think quarto preview oh yeah <laughs> anytime i have to type in front of somebody no, no, no. yeah there's too many commands <laughs> Um, is there any, okay, if I type quarto help, it will show me all the commands, right? Yeah, it's quarto dash dash help like that. Okay. Okay, so now it's going to work. Let me, <laughs> it happens because I had to reset my session. So mm -hmm. let me restart everything and then maybe it'll <laughs> error again. Uh, yeah, it's. So how how it goes, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, just a quick question: Anyone like here? Because I know we um, uh, I mean, a lot of us are fun of R. So for me, like um, trying to use the Python a lot. If I find that like, oh, I cannot do this, I quickly just jump, come back to Python to R. <laughs> yeah, same here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I... Okay. okay, so now it's working. <laughs> I swear it wasn't before. Well, hi, everyone. Oh, my goodness. Um. <laughs> yeah, and also um, that is presentation. Oh. It's a value of presentation. It's not for general quattro. The last time I attended your talk, yeah. for uh, blog, um, right? Or is it general quattro? Uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat that? You, your presentation in R Studio. Uh, um, oh, that was um about building a blog specifically. Uh, okay. uh, I'm trying to find the. I think this video. Uh, so this. Um. For Fanny Kumar, um, in the second session of this book club, I, I touched briefly about how to use Corto, uh, 
and we can um, touch on it again. I think we have an upcoming presentation on how to use Porto and Python specifically because you know I could use R with it too. Uh, so I'll find out if there is a, a date. Yep, I, I put it in the chat. Cool. Okay, so when I actually hit render, it doesn't work. That's when it gets oh, there, not preview. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, so maybe importing. Let's and see. I've tried to so library reticulate, and then like making sure that it's installed. Um, hi. Install um, NB. And then I think it normally will tell me that it's already installed. Already installed. Um. I spent, I spent like hours trying to get this to work this morning and now it's maybe working because it didn't give me the already found error. Let's see, holding her breath. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, do you have any tricks for like initializing Python when you are working in Corto in our studio? I haven't. Um, if I just loading the reticulate. Yeah, I, I that's pretty much all that I do. Let me just double check my notebook from before, but I think that's it. Um, yep. Uh -huh. Was that the same error or? Uh, yeah. And sorry. And the, what happens if you run like pip install and be format? Um, how do I stop it? Uh, there is a command, but I do not remember what it is. <laughs> Control V or Control X. Does anybody remember the which one? The, the oh, get out I, of just, I think it just quit my entire session. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 there's some way of getting out of like when you're running something in the terminal and ah, control I, Control C. Control C. C. Okay. Control C or Command C. Yeah, it will kill the process. What is it? Control C. So in Mac is um, Control C. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I'm on Windows. I think Command. I don't control know. L. Control L on Windows. Okay. Control R. What? Arrow? Arrow. Oh. Yes. Hmm. To clear the terminal. No, um, okay. To, so when a terminal is working, to interrupt the terminal, is that question? To interrupt a terminal while it is working. Okay, I don't know about that. Okay, so then to install, like, the, um, how do you, so I guess this is where I'm confused, like using this in our studio is um, like installing packages, you have to do that through the reticulate package, right? To like install it specifically to the reticulate environment. So I'm trying to, uh, I thought, um, I'll double check on my machine, but I don't remember having to load reticulate to run uh, Quarto. No, I think Koto automatically load reticulate. Oh. Yeah. Can you? That is, yeah, I think, yeah, I read it somewhere. I think um, Koto, yeah, it's like somehow kind of wrapper of 
um, reticulate so so that you'll be able to it, it just if you look at the code i can remember corso is just have a rafa and, and the behind is the reticulate mm, okay yeah uh, could so you when i'm googling a little bit on this error um yeah let me just confirm that yeah uh, can you scroll up on your um qmd file uh, to the top please or is this the this top, is the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so like Corto, calling Corto check like lists all the Corto installations and whatnot. And then it's like the Jupyter engine that's not importing NB format, but I don't really know how to install. So like um, if I run um, a code chunk in here that's import NB format, it's there, no error, but it's Corto using this Jupyter engine that doesn't have NB format, and I don't know how to install it there. I guess is the issue. Yeah. Well, one second. Let me. And this is only if you have time. I don't want to like keep you if you've got another meeting or something. Uh, one second. Oh, maybe we can meet up and chat about it too. But I. I'm trying to see hmm, what it could be. Because uh, I'm, I'm wondering like if maybe any of the other notebooks are calling uh, the Jupyter engine, but I have oh. to check. But yeah, and I haven't updated my repo in a bit, so I don't have the most up-to-date. Uh, okay, maybe we can. Yeah, I'll have to look into it a bit more. Sorry. Okay. No worries. <laughs> yeah, maybe in the chat, just discuss or something like that. Cool. Okay. So thank you guys. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, thank you Samuel. And thank you, Olua Femi Oi Dele. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.